Hello, I'm Harry Robinson. This is my third talk in the Platonic Tradition series. Begin with a brief recap. My last talk was about explanation. Explanation is causal and causation is imperceptible because it includes necessity and we cannot perceive necessity. There are no necessities in the empirical world. And this brings us back to Plato's idea of there being two worlds, which he called the world of forms and the sensible world, and we're calling the noumenal world and the empirical world. Empirical means known through the senses. Now, because causes are imperceptible, that means that explanations, when they're true, describe the noumenal world. And the more true an explanation is, the better it is. Better here means quality of explanation. So today I want to talk about quality of explanation, and in particular one very important quality, which has some surprising properties. So what is the quality of an explanation? There are at least ten criteria of an explanation, criteria which the more they are fulfilled, the better the explanation. And these criteria apply to all explanations. We can think of quite a large variety of explanations. There are lunatic fringe explanations. There is myth, which is explanatory. There are common sense explanations, theological and metaphysical explanations, and most importantly, scientific explanations. Theoretical science is explanatory. It explains empirical science. So what are these criteria? Well, first of all, there are two falsifying criteria. If an explanation contains any contradictions, it must be false, because no contradiction can be true. And if an explanation is contrary to fact, then also it must be false. When I say fact, I mean empirical fact. In science, this means that an explanation must accord with empirical data, with empirical science. If it requires empirical science to be wrong, then the explanation is false. Mostly. Occasionally, experimental data is wrong because of experimental error, but that's very rare. So, two falsifying criteria. And then there are eight criteria that verify a theory, which make it better. Two of them are what might be called scope and density of detail. The larger the scope of an explanation, the more variety it takes into its explanation. And the density of detail is simply how much detail within a given scope. There's an analogy here between explanation and photography. A photographic lens has a certain resolving power, and within its resolving power it can either use the wide-angle lens or it could be a telescopic lens. And the difference is a wide-angle lens can photograph a forest and a telescopic lens can photograph a single tree in the forest or a single branch or a single twig or a single leaf. The wide-angle lens gives you scope and the telescopic lens gives you density of detail. And the greater the resolving power, the more detail you have in both your scope and your density. So we can think of an explanation as having a resolving power. The more it explains, the better it is. And the more the quantity of explanation may be either large scope or density of detail, but preferably both. One example of a very large scope is the explanation that everything happens as it does because it happens according to the will of God. Its scope is everything, but its density, density of detail is nothing, zero, because you can't distinguish one thing from another in terms of the explanation. Another criterion of explanation is coherence. The more coherent it is, the better. Coherence means 
how much logical necessity is there in the explanation. The more logical necessity contained in the explanation, the more coherent it is, and the more coherent it is, the better it is. Simplicity is another criterion. All else being equal, if one explanation is simpler than another, we prefer the simpler explanation. Another criterion is beauty. Scientists on the whole are reluctant to talk about beauty theories, but some of them do. The most notable one was Paul Dirac, a British theorist, a physicist, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. He argued that an ugly theory cannot be true. In order to be true, a theory must be beautiful. Harmony with other explanations is also an important criterion. If you have two explanations and they don't connect, they don't harmonize, then something's wrong, something's false in one or both of them. The famous case in present theoretical physics is a disharmony between Einstein's general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics works with very, very small, General relativity works with very large, and there's not one unifying theory that encompasses them both. This is a serious problem in modern physics, and one which everyone hopes will one day be resolved preferably soon. Usually, when you get when you find a harmony between two theories, then you get unification. An early example of unification was Descartes, who unified geometry and algebra with his coordinate geometry. The best example of scientific unification was Maxwell, who unified electricity and magnetism. Before Maxwell, they had been two separate subjects. And he also unified electricity and magnetism with optics, the physics of light. Symmetry is another very important um, criteria of explanation. It applies particularly in modern physics. Symmetry is expressed mathematically with group theory, which is something I'm not going to go into at all in these talks, but quantum mechanics relies on it very heavily and it turns out to be a very important criteria. And finally, the last criteria of explanation is theoretical prediction of empirical novelty. If an explanation can predict an empirical novelty, something that has never previously been seen, then this, more than anything else, is grounds for saying the theory is true. One of the more, more famous or more important cases of prediction of novelty was Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, which predicted that light, or explained that light is a wave, at the time it was thought in the electromagnetic ether, but that's been since disqualified. But the explanation required that not only light and radiant heat were electromagnetic waves, but that there should be electromagnetic waves of all frequencies, very low frequencies below the infrared and very high frequencies above the violet. Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared was another theory that predicted novelty, namely nuclear energy, and that led to atomic bombs and nuclear power stations. No one would have dreamed of searching for radio, for example, before Maxwell's equations. No one would have dreamed of searching for nuclear energy before Einstein's equations. And it becomes an important problem in not only in philosophy and science, but also in philosophy. How is it that theory, scientific theory, can predict empirical novelty, something which has never been seen before? Quantum mechanics, for example, predicted the possibility of transistors long before they were made first. And our modern life depends <coughs> in a large way on transistors. All of information technology is based on transistors. And the old novelties, the empirical novelties, predicted before they were known. How can this be done? Well, I'm going to explain how it can be done with a diagram. And 
and start with a heroic remake sheet and gradually fill it in. We have here a whole series of uh, different categories on the sheet. No space is filled in. Now explain what the categories are. First of all, we have the numeral world and the empirical world. Plato has two worlds. The numeral world consists of things which are imperceptible, primarily, so far, necessities, necessary connections between cause and effect. We cannot perceive causations. The empirical world is perceptible, the numeral world imperceptible. And above, we have also memories and concepts and theories, and I might mention that these are also empirical, they're known by introspection, and if you allow introspection to be a kind of perception, then they are empirical. Memories are quite distinct from things in the empirical world because they're simply less vivid. They have less force and vivacity, as David Hume put it. Concepts consist of abstract ideas bonded to words. And I should mention in passing that the notion of an abstract idea is quite hotly, even passionately debated in philosophy. Do they exist or not? Are there any such things as abstract ideas, or are they all fictions? Well, in the Platonic tradition, there are abstract ideas. This is something that I'll come to in the next talk, but for now we can say that abstract ideas are what in Plato were called forms. Concepts lead to propositions. A proposition is a structure of concept or a structure of abstract ideas. And a structure of propositions is a theory, and that is our top category in this diagram. We start out by putting something in the numeral world. It's hypothetical, but we're going to put it there. It's called A1, and it is an atmospheric electric discharge. An atmospheric electric discharge is something that has never been perceived by anyone, so it's numeral. And the atmospheric electric discharge causes two things. The square contains the letter L1 and the circle contains the letter T1. L1 is a burst of electromagnetic radiation in the visible spectrum in the numeral world. And T1 is acoustic waves produced by sudden heating of the air of the numeral world. The arrows between A1 and L1 and T1 represent causal necessities. Remember that a necessity is a singular possibility. And between L1 and T1 we've got a broken arrow. And that represents correlation. L1 and T1 are correlated. They're correlated because they have a common cause, namely A1. L1 and T1 cause L2 and T2 in the empirical world. L2 is empirical lightning, and T2 is empirical thunder. And what this diagram is saying that an atmospheric electric discharge in the numeral world causes empirical lightning and empirical thunder. And there's an intermediate cause of these, namely numeral lightning and numeral thunder. And of course, L2 and T2 are correlated. I should mention that it's popularly believed that lightning causes thunder, but it doesn't. They are correlated. They are not causally related. After perceiving lightning and thunder in the empirical world, people have memories of lightning and thunder. We can say that L2 causes L3 and T2 causes T3. The causes, of course, are imperceptible, so they are labelled as numeral, but the memories are perceptible by introspection. And between the memories is a correlation, which is known as association of ideas. Out of memories, again, by numeral causation, we get concepts, L4 and T4. L4 and T4 are abstract ideas of lightning and thunder, bonded to words. I mentioned earlier that concepts are abstract ideas bonded to words. L4 and T4 
the important to mention here, are not just abstract ideas, they are reconstructions of L1 and T1. They are going to be the basis of theory, and the theory is trying to explain L2 and T2 in terms of A1 and L1 and T1. So think of L4 and T4 as developed out of memories in order to be reconstructions of L1 and T1. Out of L4 and T4, we develop a theory, A4. It's a theory, that is to say, an explanation of L2 and T2, of empirical lightning and empirical thunder. We have more solid arrows here, going from A4 to L4 and T4. These are not causations, they are logical necessities, and as such, they are perceptible within the mind by introspection and also as reconstructions of L1 and T1, L4 and T4 are a part of A4. What A4 as a theory can do, amongst other things, is get a logical necessity of something besides L4 and T4, namely R4, a deduction. R4 is deduced from A4, and a deduction includes logical necessity, which is here labeled N4. This deduction is a theoretical prediction of empirical novelty, novelty being R4. The prediction R4 says that there must be R1 in the normal world correlated with L1 and T1. R1 being electromagnetic radiation outside the physical spectrum, either of a higher frequency than anything in the physical spectrum or a lower frequency. And what our theory is saying in deducing our thoughts, predicting that there should be noise, radio noise, every time there's a thunderstorm. We should perceive lightning and thunder, L2 and T2, but we should also perceive radio noise because the lightning produces electromagnetic radiation in a wide range of frequencies. So we can suppose that after a theorist deduces R4 and predicts radio noise, except the radio is at that point unknown, there's an experimental scientist, we might suppose his name was Heinrich Hertz or maybe Marconi, builds an apparatus to detect this noise and calls it a radio. Having built the radio and then tuned it for various frequencies during a thunderstorm, every time there's a flash of lightning, R2 appears as crackle in the radio in the empirical world. And the prediction of novelty has come true. It comes true because of the causal necessity which is labelled N1. So there are two particularly important necessities here, N1 and N4. N4 which makes the prediction of novelty, and it's N1 which makes it come true. I want to emphasize there are no necessities in the empirical world or in memories. It's only logical necessities in theory or causal necessities in the normal world which can predict novelty and make it come true. And it's because the novelty comes true that the explanation, which is A4, is almost certainly true. Because if there was no necessity N4, then Predicting R4 would be mere guesswork or fancy, and it wouldn't come true, because there would be no necessity to produce R1 to produce R2. It might conceivably come true by chance, but that would be very, very rare. And we do know of lots of cases where people predict novelty, the most common one is people predicting Armageddon, the world is going to come to an end, and sometimes they predict it with a specific date, and this prediction of novelty, the world has never come to name before, but those predictions of novelty, for some reason, don't come true. So, there you have it. Quality of explanation is a source of knowledge of the lunar world. We can justifiably believe in the lunar world according to the quality of explanation. This is the important criterion of what's in the normal world and what isn't.
its quality of explanation, and in particular its theoretical prediction of empirical novelty, which only science can do. And in fact, it's a curious thing, but it's only mathematical theories which can do it. All of this will become more apparent in later talks. That's all for this talk today. Goodbye. Thank you.